Well, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Andrew Snelling, and we're here to talk about radio halos, record of catastrophic geologic processes. And I should preface this by saying that this is research, original research that I have been doing over some 20 or so years. And so uh, it's not what you'll find in the secular literature, although some of the early work on radio halos was reported in the secular literature. Well, what are radio halos? Let's start by talking about the mineral biotite in granites. Most granites contain this black flaky mica mineral, which is called biotite. It's, it's very common in most granites, and it's easily seen because of its uh, black color. Uh, within these biotite flakes often are embedded zircon crystals. Now, zircon is zirconium silicate, uh, and so it's uh, silica with uh, zirconium. And because zirconium has a, sorry, uranium has a similar ionic radius and charge to zirconium, it can substitute into the lattice of zircon. And so most zircons are radioactive with, with uranium, and therefore they're of interest to geologists for using radiometric dating, for example. Well, zircon crystals, the uranium in them decays. And uh, so when it decays, it ejects an alpha particle, which consists of two neutrons and two protons. But it's not just one step. There's a total of eight decay steps where at each step, alpha particles are ejected, eject, ejected until you finally get to the stable end member lead. In this case, uranium is the uh, isotope 238. The end member is lead 206. But that's not so much of concern to us in this presentation on radio halos. What is interesting is that each of these decay steps, the alpha particles are shot out at different, different energies, and I'll come back to that in a moment. When the zircon crystals are large, the, uh, for example, 60 microns, the alpha particles stay within the zircon grains, and so uh, where they become helium atoms, because that's also the uh, uh, helium is two protons and two neutrons, just like the alpha particle. The, the alpha particle picks up some electrons, and so it ends up being helium. So in other words. For every atom of uranium that decays, there's eight helium atoms produced, one for each of those eight decay steps. Now, when the zircon crystals are small, as little as only one micron in size, the alpha particles actually go outside the zircon and uh, so into the surrounding biotite. Remember, the zircon grains are embedded inside the biotite flakes. And so the alpha particles shoot outside of the, the zircon grains. As a consequence, these alpha particles are like little bullets. It's like firing a gun, a bullet from a gun, into a drywall. You're going to leave a hole. You're going to damage it. And so these alpha particles are energetic enough to, uh, to uh, damage the surrounding crystal structure uh, in the biotype. And that damage causes discoloration, which you can observe under the microscope. Now, of course, each uh, little built bullet, uh, so these, are, these, these spheres of discoloration, because remember, it's in three, so no, in two dimensions, it's an area. In three dimensions, it's a sphere, because those little bullets are shooting out in all directions from the central zircon crystal. It forms a discoloration called a radioactive halo, which is abbreviated to radio halo. And uh, so the halo of damage from radioactive decay, a radio halo. That's where the term comes from. I'm not getting advanced here. Ah, okay. So as I said, at each decay step, the uh, alpha particles are injected at different energies. And you can see in this diagram the different energies for these different steps from uranium 238, 234 down to 234M, etc., all the way down to lead. And uh, at each of these steps, that means the different energies will call them, cause the bullets to travel different distances. So, for you know, it's like having the difference between a handgun and a high powered rifle. 
the bullets are going to go different distances according to the energy from by which they're fired. And as a consequence, uh, those bullets go different, those alpha particles go different distances into the surrounding uh, biotite crystal. And the most damage is done where the bullets stop. And so you end up producing rings at different distances from the central zircon crystal. Now it has been determined, and here's a photograph of a fully formed uranium radiohalo, and you can see many of those eight steps there. Some are close, uh, rings there. Some of them are close together, and therefore they get blue. But it's been determined to, that to fully form a dark uranium radio halide, like the one you see on the screen there, requires between 500 million to a billion alpha particles. And uh, this is, was determined by experimentation by uh, Robert Gentry, who was working at Oak Ridge National Laboratory at the time he was doing some of this work. I was just trying to get this machine to clean. Now, that many alpha particles are equivalent to at least 100 million years' worth of radioactive decay as measured today. That's at the slow rate of decay today. Uh, it, as we argued in a previous lecture on radiometric dating, there's evidence that decay rates were accelerated in the past, and in fact, we'll come to that in a moment. But at today's rate of, of decay, uranium decay, it would take 100 million years to produce a dark radio halo like that. Now, granites around the world contain these dark uranium radio halos. So that means all of these granites thus contain observable physical evidence <clears throat> of abundant nuclear decay at least 100 million years worth at today's decay rate. Now, this is important because during the radioisotopes and age of the Earth project, the rate project that I referred to in the previous lecture, one of the things we wanted to determine was whether there was actual physical evidence that a lot of decay had occurred. Because some creationists were arguing that the decay might not have occurred, it might be just the geochemistry of the rocks. Well, here we have evidence of abundant nuclear decay, physical evidence, observable physical evidence in the rocks. And here's some examples, the ruby granite in the Grand Canyon, uh, in Counter Bay granite in South Australia, the Kuma granite in New South Wales, we'll come back to that one later. The Shack granite in England, we'll come back to that one later. Stone Mountain, Georgia, it's got radio halos in it. Half Dome granite in Yosemite National Park. All of these granites contain fully formed uranium radio halos. Now, in many granites, biotakes of flakes are found with radio halos consisting of only one small ring. One ring. And alongside them are the dark uranium radio halos with the eight rings. Or in this instance, you can see it's very dark, so the rings are being blurred. But you can see the halo on the right only has one small ring. And we also find in some granites, biotite flakes with radio halos containing only two rings. In the same biotite flakes, we've got very dark uranium radio halos. When they're very dark, that means they've had more than 100 million years' worth of, of decay occur to produce that many, uh, to, to darken and damage the, the crystal that much. And in some granites, in some biotite plates, we found ring, we find radio halos consisting of only three rings together with the uranium radio halos. Now, remember the uranium radio halo has eight rings. And we know, we can know from the different energies which ring refers to which atom that decay, because at each of those steps you've got a parent and daughter. And it turns out that these rings correspond to the last three alpha decay steps in the uranium uh, decay series. To the, to the alpha particles par parented by polonium-218, by 214 polonium and by polonium 2110. And you can see from this diagram that uh, the three rings will be as a result of polonium because you've got the polonium 218 ring, then it decays down to 214, which decay, which does its ring, which decays down to 21, uh, past two, sorry, to produce 210, which decays to produce its own ring, and then you've got lead 206 at the end. 
whereas if you've got two rings, that's only 214 decaying and then 210 decaying. But if you've got one ring, it's only playing 210. So the number of rings and the size of those rings determine that these were actually parented by these polonium isotopes, which are part of the uranium decay chain. Okay. But there's a problem, oh, which we'll come to in a moment. These polonium radiohydros are found alongside uranium radiohydros in many granites around the world. So it's not just a, a one-only phenomenon. It's very common. The ruined granite we saw before, the Palmer granite, in South Australia, the Shap granite we saw in the Lake District, the La Posta granite east of San Diego, all of these have these, uh, both these radio, all these radio halos in them, and many others that I haven't uh, thrown up on the screen there. Now, the interesting thing is these polonium radio halos, which is what they're called, because they're parroted by polonium, so we call them the two, three, two, one, two, and three ring radio halos, we call polonium radio halos. These have been described in a US famous US court case as a very tiny mystery. It was 1989. It was in the Arkansas uh, creation uh, case, and Robert Gentry was on the on the stand. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was the director of the US, uh, the deputy director of the US Geological Survey at the time, Dr. G. Brent Dalrymple, who, when he was confronted with this evidence, referred to it as a very tiny mystery. In other words, he just dismissed the evidence that Bob Gentry had given that these uh, radio halos, in his mind, were evidence of creation. Well, the reason they're a tiny mystery is because these unstable polonium isotopes only have fleeting existences or decay rates. Polonium-218 has a half-life of only 3.1 minutes. Polonium-214 has a half-life of only 164 microseconds. And plane 210, the longest of the three, has a half life of only 138 days. So, you know, in the case of plane 214, if you blink, it's gone. It, it decays so rapidly. So, how are you going to form these halos when these, uh, these isotopes decay so rapidly? And that's why Gentry proposed that you have to form these extremely rapidly. And, in fact, he went on to call these as God's fingerprints of creation. In fact, he did a movie called a Fingerprints of Creation. And uh, he claimed there was no natural process capable of forming, forming these polonium radio halos because he claimed a concentration of 50% polonium is needed in the radio centre all at once. Now, what I mean by the radio centre well, in the case of those uranium radio halos, the zircon is at the centre of them. The, the zircon is producing the radioactivity from uranium to produce the halo. So what we're saying in the centre of the polonium radio halo, you have to have polonium, the alpha decay from it, produce the polonium radio halo. That's what I mean by a radio centre. And it all had to be there at once. That's what he claimed. But here's the problem. So... For a 214 halo to form would require 50% concentration of polonium 214 to be there in the radio centre within a millisecond or two. Otherwise, the radio home wouldn't exist. That's according to his model, 50% concentration. But here's the problem. Why would God create the polonium radio halos as his fingerprints of creation and then allow the uranium radio halos to subsequently form alongside them over millions of years in the same biotype flakes. It, it does seem inconsistent. If the uranium radio halos took 100 million years or more to form and the polonium radio halos were instant, instantaneous, that means that God created the biotites in the granites of all the granites instantly with the polonium radio halos in them. And then over the next 100 million years or so, that you know, the uranium radio halos form. That doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, many of these granites in which we find the polonium radio halos and uranium halos together are actually granites that formed during the flood. And this is when I came to discover Robert Gentry's work and interacted with him in the early 1990s. I began to hear, have serious questions about his model simply because these granites, so many of these granites formed during the flood. They weren't there 
prior to the flood. And I'm going to show you an example uh, shortly of where you can actually walk from fossil bearing uh, flood sediments into a granite through progressive zones of increasing heat and pressure that metamorphose the rocks before you get to the zone of melting that formed the granite. And that had to be during the flood because the granite is made out of the melting of fossil bearing flood sediments. And so, and that granite has lots of palladium radial halos in it. So it can't have been a, an artifact of God's fingerprints of creation. And of course, the scriptures teach that the earth is only about 6,000 years old. So it can't have been 100 million years to form these uranium radial halos. So obviously, a new model for the formation of radial halos was required. Now, polonium is a rare element. Where did it come from to form the plane radio halos? And um, it was a, 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 actually, the story goes, when I was trying to think all this through, I was um, working for ICR and I was visiting <laughs> San Diego and I went to the Scripps Oceanographic Institution, which had a, has a really good library, and, uh, you know, and I, I looked up the catalogue and I discovered there was a book on the chemistry of the rare earth, of the rare metals, including polonium. And uh, they had a copy in the, in the library. So I was able to get all the information about the chemistry of polonium, which was very interesting. And I discovered the chemistry of polonium is very similar to lead and uh, it behaves in a similar way to lead. But... In the case of these biotype flakes where we find the polonium, the nearest source of polonium would be the uranium that's decaying within the zircons because the polonium is in, is the zircons have got uranium that's decaying all the way down to lead and as it goes down to lead, it's producing polonium. <laughs> and this is within millimetres or less than where we find the polonium radio halos. I'm thinking, wait a minute. What if, what if the pioneer actually came from the, the zircons at the centres of the uranium radio halos? And so that, if that's the case, that means the polonium and uranium radio halos formed at the same time. As the uranium was decaying to form the uranium radio halos, some of the polonium produced has, was somehow moved to nearby produce the polonium radio halos at the same time. What could have done that? Well, we know, and I'll come to this in a moment, that many of these biotype flakes have been altered by the fluids in the granites. The leftover water has come out of the solution, uh, the, the magmas as the granites cool, has actually flowed between the biotype flakes to alter them and that would have been sufficient to move the polonium. So if that's the case, by the way, if the polonium was derived from the zircon in the centre of these crystals, uh, these, uh, the radio centres of these here, was derived, it moved, moved between the biotite has a sheet structure, which is illustrated here. It's like a stack of leaves of a book. Uh, sh they're called sheets, sheet silicates. And uh, it means the water can flow between those sheets. And how it would have to deliver enough polonium in the time the uranium is decaying here, it would have to deliver enough polonium to form these polonium halos, 500 to 1 billion alpha particles to form each dark polonium radio halo. But remember, that has to happen before the polonium decays. But, of course, it doesn't have to be delivered all at once. It could be progressively delivered over a longer period of time if the water's flowing, as long as it gets enough polonium to deposit in the same location every time, you can progressively transport that polonium to generate your polonium radio halo in the same time as the uranium is decaying. But it can't be 100 million years over which that's happening because... Uh, you, you, you just wouldn't generate enough polonium in that time to do that do that process. So you have to have at least 100 million years worth, years worth at today's rates of uranium decay to actually occur within days to form these polonium radio halos. 
if you weren't moving at the polonium fast enough and generating it fast enough to move it fast enough, you wouldn't get it into position to form those polonium radiohalos before the polonium decay. And remembering we're getting 214 polonium radiohalos and the polonium 214 only exists for microseconds. Ah, but what about the parents to the polonium? What if it was higher up in the sequence, we've got radon, which is a gas, and we've got radium. And uh, they could also be transported by the fluids so that they get to this location. And they've got longer half-lives, so that gives you a little bit more, more time. But it does mean, potentially, that uh, this, is, this is evidence of accelerated nuclear decay. Conclusions. Dark uranium radar has in many granites around the world are observable physical evidence of abundant nuclear decay that has occurred at least 100 million years worth at today's rates. Coexisting uranium and polonium radar has in many granites of the world had to form at the same time and so are observable physical evidence that this abundant nuclear decay had to have been accelerated. That's the only way you can generate enough polonium fast enough to produce these radio halos if the uranium decay was accelerated. Remember I said when I was talking about uh, accelerated decay, when I was talking about radiometric dating, the shorter the half-life, the less acceleration. So potassium uh, was accelerated less, the decay was accelerated less than that of uranium because it's a, a slower decay rate. So it wouldn't have accelerated decay, wouldn't have sped up polonium decay, but it would have sped up uranium decay. So here's the model that I developed, that the idea that fluids, hot water, which when a, when a granite crystallizes, uh, you're going to have 10% of a magma, a granite magma can be water. And when you crystallize, the, make the minerals that crystallize to form a granite, most of that water doesn't go into the crystals. Some of it does. Most of it gets left in the grains in between, and it's hot, hundreds of degrees Celsius, and so it's moved, it moves. By the way, metals also get left over from the crystals, and they're in the fluids, and one of those metals is gold, another is copper, and some of the largest copper deposits in the world are granites with the, 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 the metals that are concentrated from the fluids at the end of the, end of the process. Uh, so here we can here we can see uh, we're, we're going to produce. We've got a a uh, I'm the battery on this now. Here we go. Here we have the uranium radio halo alongside of it the the zircon uh, the uh, plane radar. And often we don't find a visible inclusion. We can see the crystal of the zircon inside here, but we can't see. It. There's just a hole there at the moment which indicates that it might even have been just fluid there that has since dissipated. There's no hot, solid crystal there. And many of these polonium radiohalos are one millimetre or less away from where you have the zircon crystal with the uranium, which is generating the polonium. Now, here's an important observation. The radiohalos can only form below 150 degrees. How do we know that? Well... As, as uh, was found in a drill hole, in, and it's been tested experimentally, uh, a drill hole where they drilled down into a granite and actually measured the temperature of the rock as you went down, near the surface, the granite had radio halos in it. But when they got down to 150 degrees C at a depth where the incipient temperature is 150 degrees, the radio halos had faded, <clears throat> and below that they disappeared. What a, and so that's what we call by annealing. What it, what's happening? Well, remember, if you remember your physical chemistry, you've got a crystalline structure, lattice work, atoms are vibrating, okay? And what happens is heat increases the energy of that vibration. So, for example, if you hit that crystal with an alpha particle, it's going to damage and distort that lattice. And that's the discoloration that produces the halo. But what happens when you apply heat? 
Well, the atoms are going to vibrate till they get to a temperature which they have so much energy they snap back into their original position, their pre-undamaged position. And that will then eliminate all that discoloration and the halo will disappear. So the transverse of that is that if, if you've got the rock at a temperature above 150 degrees, which is the temperature at which that, that annealing takes place, above 150 degrees, when the alpha particle comes through, it, it, it will initially damage the crystal, but it'll be vibrating so quickly it'll snap back into position. So the, the damage will be erased as, as the same time it's being formed. So you won't record the radio halo. So that means the radio halo can only form below 150 degrees C, which is a very important. Um, it's still very hot because it's above the boiling point of water, which is 100 degrees. We also know that the, uh, the uranium forms a uh, halo forms around the tiny zircon crystal. The uranium in the zircon just supplies radon, radium, then radon, then polonium, and these can these can, are soluble. In fact, I found evidence papers to show that radon uh, was very soluble in hydrothermal fluids. So was radium, and radium has a has a very long half life. Rad radon Half-life is a, a, a number of days, so you've got a lot more time to, uh, as well as polonium, uh, you've got a lot more time, therefore, with uh, radon, for example, uh, 3.8 days, I think it is from memory, to move before it decays to polonium. But remember, radon is an inert gas, and that's why it's going to more readily move because it's not going to be chemically attracted to any of the other atoms in the lattice. But as soon as it turns to polonium as a result of decay, you've got a different chemistry, and therefore it's more likely, as it behaves like the metal lead, to attach itself to any sulfur atoms, for example, or fluorine atoms or chlorine. Chlorine is a very uh, major element in hydrothermal fluids, hot fluids in granites, uh, that's how gold is transported as gold chlorides in the fluids to produce the gold veins that come out of these granites. So we know a lot about these fluids. So the hydrothermal water, the hot water, hydro water, uh, hot, the hydrothermal means hot water, the hot fluid flows along the cleavage planes. That is between these uh, stacked leaves of uh, crystal uh, leaves that make up the biotite crystal, uh, picking up. Picking up radon and uh, polonium out of the out of the zircon crystal as it's produced by uranium decay, and so it moves to adjacent sites where it concentrates around atoms in a certain location that uh, are attractive to the polonium. And I said chlorine, fluorine, sulfur. They're three of the leading candidates we know are in hydrothermal fluids. And, and therefore, they can also come out of the solutions uh, and lock into a location within the crystal, within the biotite crystal structure. And once you get the polonium starting to stop in one location, what's going to happen? It's going to decay and start to damage the crystal. But as soon as it decays, it, re it releases its grip on the sulfur atom that it was hooked onto out of the fluids. So that sulfur atom is now ready to hook another polonium atom out of the fluids that's going past, it decays, hooks another one, it decays, hooks another one. So over a period of time, even though the polonium only asks, alas, for a fleeting existence, you're going to sequentially keep on adding polonium <coughs> into that location, which is going to keep on damaging the area around to form the, the polonium radio halo. And so this is the sequence. It moves, it, it latches onto a, a uh, sulfur atom, and it's going to start decaying until it forms the, the radio halo. But this is a very, very short time span. Now, what evidence do we have of rapid hydrothermal fluid transport of the polonium forming adjacent polonium radio halos? Well, the short half-lives of polonium, of polonium are, are important. The short tr transport distance is involved. The empty bubbles now at the centres of nearly all the polonium radio halos. And very importantly, I made a prediction that you get the greater number of polonium radio halos where there were greater volumes of hydrothermal fluids. Now, let me just digress here for a moment. 
when I was doing this work, I wanted to be able to compare the sample of, of, of different rocks from different uh, granites, different granites uh, or other rocks. I've also found these in metamorphic rocks that we'll come back to in a moment. Um, but how do we know that there's more more halos in one granite than another? You know, you can take a sample and look at under a microscope. You've got to be able to have some quantifiable comparison. So what I did is each sample, I made 50 microscope slides containing 20, around 20 biotype flakes that were then examined and the halos counted in those 50 times 20. That's a 1,000 biotype flakes per sample of granite. So therefore, I could compare this granite with that granite by that kind of careful statistical treatment of the number. And so I could therefore work out situations where there was evidence in the rock that there had been greater volumes of hydrothermal fluids. I was predicted I'm going to find more plane in radio halos. That would be a consequence of this model for the formation of the radio halos. Now, here's some restrictions and implications. Fully formed uranium radio halos require at least 100 million years worth of uranium decay <laughs> at today's decay rate, half life of nearly 4.5 billion years. Uh, Billions, that should be. Yeah, sorry, 4.5 billion years. So only that much uranium decay will supply the polonium concentrations needed to form the polonium radio halos. You need 100 million years worth, but you need to do it at a very quick rate. The, the radon and polonium isotopes have half lives. As I said, radon, 3.8 days, 3.1 minutes, 164 microseconds, 138 days. So you've got to have it very quickly. So that means the polonium radio halos have to form within hours and days. And 100 million years worth of uranium decay had to have been concurrently occurring as the, that should read, polonium radio halos form. In other words, within hours to days, you have to have 100 million years worth of uranium decay. So the uranium decay had to be grossly accelerated. Now here's another interesting point. But the radon and polonium isotopes had to also survive while the host granite magmas cooled from 650 or 300, uh, 730 degrees C to below 150 degrees C. Now let me unpack that statement. I'm going to give you a graph in a minute. But a granite magma forms at temperatures between 650 and 730 degrees C. And then the rocks, uh, the magma starts to cool and the minerals crystallize. Below 373 degrees, the water starts to come out of superheated steam. But then it has to be below 150 degrees before the radio halos start forming. So if it takes millions of years for the granite to cool, all the polonium's already going to be produced from the zircon crystals that start crystallizing way back when the granite magma is at 650 degrees. Uh, it's all going to be gone by the time you get to the millions of years of granite formation. So the conclusion is that if the halos have to form in a few days, the plenum radio halos have to form in a few days, and this was after the granites had been going, going through a lot of cooling, which can't have been millions of years, all the plenum would have been gone, the granites had to cool within days. So this was actually an implication which was exciting because one of the arguments that have been made for many years in the literature by people like Davis Young, lampooning creationists and saying, how can you how can you form granites during the one year of the flood? It takes millions of years. Well, the radio halos are evidence that the granites cool very rapidly. And I've got a diagram here to show you the granite crystallizes up here when when it when you when it forms in this area here, biotite crystals are way up here, uh, above 600 degrees, they're crystallized, the zircons crystallize at even higher, and uh, you start, all the grains are in place by 700, uh, 573 degrees C, the water comes out, sorry, 385 degrees C, the, the first release of hydrothermal fluids to start transporting radon and polonium. The hydrothermal fluids start flowing in this temperature band, 
but it's only below 150 degrees that you start to get the halos form. By the time the water gets down to 75 degrees C, it's starting to slow down and not be very uh, rapid in its motion, and it's losing its potential to carry the halos. So if the Polony halos only form within days, you've only got to have days to get through this cooling curve for the granites. Well, let's test this polonium halos formation model. And to do it, I actually went to the Great Smoky Mountains. And uh, you might say, but there's no granites there, precisely. Um, because I'd already had an inkling that the radio halos were also found in metamorphic rocks. Because when a rock metamorphic, a sedimentary rock can have water in it, and when it metamorphoses, the water is in it. But some of these metamorphic reactions where minerals transform actually release water. And I'd read in the literature about this in regard to the metamorphic zones within the uh, Akoi supergroup, the Thunderhead Sandstone, which is outcrops between Gatlinburg and Cherokee, uh, on the highway going over, over through the Great Smoky Mountains. And, of course, it's the only national park in the US that's free to get into because it's a highway that links two states, and so they couldn't charge a toll or entrance fee. So that was great. I didn't have to get permission. I just go in there and get the samples, which was really good. Now, what, what, we've, what was in the literature was that as you go from Gatlinburg over here, you get evidence in the rocks that the temperatures of metamorphism were low and you only get biotite produced in this sandstone. But as you go over the, over, over the uh, crest of the, uh, the mountain chain there, uh, you go through the garnet zone. That is the zone where the temperature and pressures were so high that in the sandstone, the clay in the sandstone had formed garnets. And then you go over the other side because you can see the bends in the highway. This is the steep section. There's the, there's the border. The state line is right at the high crest of the Great Smokies. You come down here and you go into the storolite zone which is a luminosilicate mineral, which is produced at higher temperatures and pressure. And finally, you get down to Cherokee and get into the kyanite zone, which is another luminosilicate, and it's even higher it produced. It. All of this is determined in the laboratory. We, we produce these minerals in the laboratory so that we can figure out the temperatures in which these rocks form. So you're increasing in temperature and pressure as you go in this direction. And... What happens is as you as you as you go in through an area, you you go you're looking at rocks that have got garnet, and suddenly you walk across and you're in another area, and there's no garnets anymore, and you've got storolites, storolite instead. So we call that boundary an isograd, iso meaning same, grad meaning uh, conditions or temperature pressure conditions. Or metamorphic grade, grad for grade. Uh, so it's the same grade of temperature and pressure. And at that boundary, there had to have been a, a reaction to change the chemistry of the rock to produce garnets, taking the chemistry of rock that was producing garnets to now producing storolite instead because of the water and the, and the chemistry of the rock. And... Uh, Here's uh, some of these rocks, you know, you get all sorts of riffraff for uh, field assistance. You might recognise that gentleman there. And uh, this is what it looked like under the... This is a sandstone that's been metamorphosed. And uh, in this, you can see biotite flakes in, in here. These are all biotite flakes. And many of these you can see, uh, in some places you can see radio halos. And the metamorphic reaction of the storyline isograd I read you take 54 muscovite and 31 chloride to produce biotite. This is, this is um, atomic um, units of muscovite and biotite. So you get 20, 224 units of water produced. And that's a huge amount of water. In fact, of all the mineral reactions, this was the one that produced the most water. And when I read that in the literature, I said, Kurt, if we get samples along that highway, I bet you at the Sterilite Isograd, 
you'll find more polonium radiohalons. He said, come on, you're kidding. I said, no, if my model is right, we should find more, because of more water produced there to transport the polonium from uranium in zircons in the biotite flakes, that will produce, produce more polonium radiohalons. And so what do I do? We collected these samples. You can see this 10, 9. We started over here and we went this way, and these are the samples. So 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 are either side of a sterolite isocrat. And what kind of results did we get? Bingo. We went from, you know, um, this is per sample. We went from, you know, 30, 40, 30, 40, the ones closest to the sample, we were getting you know, five times the number of polonium radio halides. Slam done. Well, let's go to another location where we found it in metamorphic rocks as well. The Kuma metamorphic co complex is in southeastern Australia. It's in the textbooks as a classic example of zones of increasing metamorphism in silstones and shales. And uh, at the centre, the temperature of metamorphism was so high that the rocks melted to form a granite. And you actually walk literally from fossil bearing flood sediments, graptolites, in the fossil graptolites, you literally walk, as you go, you can walk through where the temperature and pressures got higher and higher with different metamorphic rocks till you finally get into the zone where the rocks had melted. And you can see strips of material that was melted had been melted because it's, the temperature dropped so it froze in that position. And then you get into the granite in the centre. And uh, this is a classic textbook example. And here, here's the location in southeastern Australia. Uh, Cooma is actually the centre the service centre for the Australian Snowy Mountains. Yes, we do have snow, we do have ski slopes uh, that are active during the winter. And uh, Cooma was, the mountains actually were the focus of a big uh, hydroelectric scheme that was developed after the Second World War. That's another story. But here we can see this this uh, metamorphic complex. i get this to work for me. This metamorphic complex, here's the granite in the centre. Out here we've got the low grade, out, out further we've got the fossil bearing sediments out here. We can walk through these zones, better developed on this side. And you can see I, I could go along these highways, which is what I did to get the samples. Here's a closer view, and these are my sample locations here. Going through the, the biotite zone, because you have to have biotite for zircons to be in them. Biotite, of course, continues all the way through. But once you go here, you get andalusite, another aluminosilicate added to biotite in the rock. You get in here, you've got K felspar, potassium felspar. Migmatite is where you've got the, the rock starting to have evidence of melting, and then it's totally melted here to form the granite and then re recrystallize. So here's an example of one of these outcrops. Uh, we said in another lecture, that's the sort of hammer that a hard rock geologist uses. You've got to use a little bit more muscle power to break these rocks. And this is what these rocks look like under the microscope. See the see the radio halos sticking out here in the in the um, in the uh, biotite here. They're all over the place, everywhere. Now, what did we find? Biotite uh, polonium two ten radio halos were found throughout all the metamorphic zones. In the, and into the Kuma granite. But the polonium 214 and 218 halos in uranium only found in the highest grade metamorphic zone, the potassium felspar zone, and in the zone where the rock melted, the migmatite zone, and in the Kuma granite. In other words, you had a lot more water flow. The rate of alum was increased progressively with increasing metamorphism, and they dropped off in the zone where the rock melted, but increased again in the granite. And that matches what was I predicted because the volumes of hydrothermal fluids, hot water, involved in metamorphism and granite intrusion would increase except into the centre of the complex, except in the migmatite zone. Why do I say that? Well, in the zone of melting, what happens is water gets absorbed into the, mag into the melt, melt material. 
It's not being released. It gets absorbed. It gets consumed in the melting process. It's only when a granite recrystallizes that it releases that water. While it's metamorphosed, you're getting water moving around. But once it melts, the, ma the, the melt takes up the melt takes up the water from the rock that's being melted. It's only in the rock from which it's been melted that you're going to get the radio halos. And so that's what I predicted. Here's some of these radio halos. Uh, again, there's where the samples were found. So the the, 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 the samples particularly of interest are five, six, seven, uh, and here in the granite, A and B. And here's what we see. The total radio halos, number of radio halos increased as the volume of fluids increased into the Hay-Felspar zone, the height, and they dropped dramatically in the migmatite where there was less water available to transport polonium and then dramatically increased again in the granite, which is directly, directly predicted from, uh, from the, the, the processes that would have been operation there. Now, the Shap granite, another example. Now we're going on to looking at colonial radio housing grants. The Shap granite is in the Lake District of Northern England. It intrudes into fossil bearing, sedimentary rock layers, and underlying volcanic lavas and ash beds. So it's uh, and the heat and hydrothermal flows from the crystallizing granite generated a broad metamorphic alteration zone around the granite. The granite contains large pink felspar crystals due to the large volume of hydrothermal fluids. It's well documented in the literature that to grow these large pink potassium felspar crystals requires large volumes of hydrothermal fluids. And how do they know that? Well, there's also evidence of metal deposits associated veins with metals which would have been carried by the fluids. Here's the Shap granite. This is the part of Britain we're talking about near the border country with Scotland. Here's the Shap granite in here. It's a very beautiful area. Uh, this is the Lake District, made famous uh, by the Keswick, Keswick Convention. It was a big um, outdoor uh, preaching event in uh, England, big conference that was held every year in England, it still is. And uh, um, Beatrice Potter wrote some of her books in this area of the Lake District, children's books. Here's the here's the uh, shack granite, and here's the metamorphic uh, aureole that is the the surrounding <laughs> zone of metamorphism. Contact metal, the heat heat from the, the fluids from the granite. By the way, this shack granite is famous because it's one of the main granites that's used as a building material and uh, decorative building material in buildings, for example, in London. Um, it's it, it's uh, well known in England as a famous stone. Here's the quarry, the old quarry from which many of the the, uh, the uh, slabs of granite were taken for building decorative building. Here's these large pink crystals. That's the potassium felspar mineral, and of course that's that, that's a target for potassium argon dating. Of course, here's what the granite looks like under <laughs> the microscope, and you can see. You can see a halo here. Uh, this was very rich in halos. Here's some of the biotite plates with the halos. This is where I've peeled. This is where the, the, the biotites, we, I crushed the rock to release the, the biotite plates and then put the biotite plates, stick them onto the microscope slide so you can look at them and count the radio halos. There were similar large numbers of uranium polonium radio halos found in all samples of the granite. Neither the granite nor the polonium radio halos, therefore, can be primordial because this was in a flood, produced it's, it's in flood uh, sediments. And, of course, again, it, it illustrates that the cooling of this shaft granite had to be very rapid. This There had to be fluids that were moving uh, right through this whole process to be able to make these large felspar crystals and move the polonium. And uh, interestingly, the numbers of radio halos, I've got a sample right here near the boundary. This is the, the same location. It's just a close-up view. This is the granite. This is the host rock. A sample right at the boundary, this one here, had similar large numbers of radio halos to samples from other places in the, in the granite. 
The Yosemite National Park also consists exclusively of granite. And uh, one of those groups of granite bodies is called the Tuolumne Intrusive Suite. Uh, you can you primarily, um, it, it includes the half dome in the, in the valley, the valley, and on the cliffs to the north, and you go up to the uh, Tuolumne Meadows. All of that area is the same granite body as well. And many of these granite bodies have intruded into one another. So here we've got a, um, there is, a, yes, and when they intruded one, there's no evidence of boundary heat alteration effects when the later granites intruded the earlier granites. So the earlier crystallized granites were still warm as the later granites were intruded into them. And even in the, even in the conventional paradigm, uh, the granites intruded very rapidly one after the other. They, they want them over millions of years. But there's very few, little time, even the conventional time scale between these between these granites. Here's the uh, boundary of the Yosemite National Park. The rock units I'm talking about are, are the Ptolemy Intrusive Sweep. You get this pointed out here. This is the what? Give me hurry here. We'll get up to work. The Ptolemy Intrusive Sweep. Yeah, this this area here, this one through here. Uh, this is in the this is in the valley here. Our dome is in here. Up here you've got the Tuolumne Meadows. There's the valley half dome on the left. Everything you see there is granite. And uh, here's uh, Tanaya Lake as you're going up into up to the um, Tuolumne Meadows. Here's some of the outcrops of these different granites by the road. Uh, here's another one of my uh, my third assistants. That's Dr. Larry Vardley. And uh, that's the that's the half dome granite diorite outcropping. There's actually a, 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 an overlook to the left here. So we were ducked around the corner when no one was listening or hearing or seeing us to get those samples. <laughs> here's what the granites look like under the microscope. The numbers of Pioneer radar hose increase almost exponentially from the very first, very few in the first intruded body, the granite iodide of Cuna Crest, to large numbers in the last two intruded granites, the Cathedral Peak Granite Diorite and the Johnson Granite Porphyry. This correlates directly with evidence of progressive increasing volume of hydrothermal fluids in the later granite bodies. The, uh, the Cathedral Peak Granite Diorite has large pink felspar grains just like the Shap granite. And the Johnston Granite Porphyry, even the conventional wisdom is that it was connected through a volcano to the surface. And so fluids were coming up, huge amounts of fluids, because this is the last phase of this series of granite intrusions. Here's some of these biotite flakes with halos in them. You can see them there and uh, there. This is the Cathedral uh, Peak Granite Diorite with a large pink felspar, which, which will be the result of lots of hydrothermal fluids. And so this is a diagram out of the literature, sequential development. Here's the first, the magma in the centre, it's cooling around the edge to produce this first granite body, which was then intruded by the half dome granite in, in, in two phases finishing with the Cathedral Peak Granite Diorite and finally the Johnson. So these were overlapping, intruding into one another, pushing aside the earlier granite and, and progressively as, it, as you go through this sequence, you progressively get more and more hydrothermal fluids. For the last one, the granite, uh, Johnson Granite Porphyry, you would expect the highest numbers of Palladium radio halides. Uh, this is out of the literature, by the way. Uh, the fluids increase so that eventually, with the, why they talk about the last phase, the Johnson granite porphyry being connected to a volcano, is the fluids would have been so great that the fluids would have forced their way up uh, as steam, because most of what comes out of a volcano is steam, and actually produce volcanic eruptions at the surface. And uh, so that means we would we would predict that you would have the greatest numbers in that, and we do. You find that the greatest numbers are found in radio halides. Well, I'm nearly nearly done. 
this was an interesting piece of research that I'm going to show you some very old photographs. Now, as I said before, Gentry, Robert Gentry, had claimed granites are primordial rocks due to fear creation because the planes halos of God's fingerprints. The Bathurst Batholith, which is a, a larger granite body in Australia, consists of a major pluton, which is a smaller granite body, and satellite stocks, which are other small bodies of granite, intruded by a major dike, which is where you have granite, that uh, molten rock that goes along a fracture, forms a vertical, cuts across the strata. Uh, and then, then they were, that was both the, the, the main pluton, the main body, and the major dike were intruded by minor dikes. So you have a number of phases of granite intrusions. Okay, And I'll illustrate this very quickly, as you'll see in a moment. So, but the Bathurst granite intrudes fossiliferous, that is, flood deposits sedimentary strata, while still hot. It cuts across the regional strike, which is the direction the sedimentary layers are, uh, the disposition of the sedimentary layers, and this north-south, the granite cuts across the east-west. So it structurally disrupted the sedimentary layering. So that shows you that the granite was there, up, came in after the sediments. And uh, we can see, I'll show you that uh, some of the vein that came out from the edge of the granite into the surrounding host rocks produced uh, contact metamorphism. That is, the heat and the fluids affected the sedimentary rocks. Here's where, the, where it is. Here's Sydney, uh, Australia's largest city. And over the mountains, there's mountains in here. Uh, you've got this batholith, the batholith. batholith. Here's a, here's a uh, picture of it here. Here's the north-south trend of the sedimentary and volcanic layers that, that it's intruded into. And here's a close-up. This area here, by the way, uh, was mapped and sampled by myself back in 1974. It was my honours thesis for my uh, university studies. Um, it was like a mini master's degree. And it was exciting for me to come back in 1999 and collect these regional samples, add to the ones I already still have, I collect, kept pieces of them. So I could actually reuse what I had done in, in my undergraduate studies in 1974 and 1999 uh, to collect, the, collect these other samples to look for radio halos. And that was, that was quite exciting to be able to Recycle. That's why these photographs, this is a scan, scan of faded uh, photographs that were in my thesis. And uh, the, the low-lying country is the granite because it eroded out more easily. It weathered and eroded. The host sedimentary rocks fossil, where it formed the ridges. This is the main uh, railway, railroad that comes out of Sydney and heads west, and eventually you, you can get a train on this track that goes all the way from Sydney to Perth. It's called the Indian Pacific, between the Indian Pacific Oceans. Uh, here's an, yeah, okay. Here's where in one of these railroad cuttings, you can actually see the edge of the granite here, the contact zone of the granite. You can see where veins of granite went out into the host rocks. So that indicates that the granite was molten. This couldn't be, these are fossiliferous setup. This couldn't be, you know, God created it in place. It had to have being rocks that melted during the flood and intruded into these into these rocks. Now the Evans Crown Dyke, which was that major dyke that cut across the Bathurst granite and the host sediment which started, had to be still hot. Its central portions are coarse and even grey, but it's got chilled margins. And you see evidence of flow banding and other other features that indicate rapid cooling. Here's the map that I produced for my uh, thesis. Here's the here's the edge of the here's at the edge of the the, the Bathurst granite. Can get this to work for me all the time. The red is the bottom is the Bathurst granite. The pink is that is that dike, and the, you can see the, the the blues and the blues greens and mauves. That's the host sedimentary rocks. Here's a cross section shows that the dike cuts through those sedimentary rocks, but it also cuts through the major granite. Here is a photograph of it uh, in outcrop. Uh, the minor, now, minor granite dikes, 
that were still hot, while the granite was still hot, that cut across the granite and this major dike, as well as the host strata. Uh, they have the same composition. All these granites have the same composition and the same texture that indicate they came from the orig the same original parent magma. They were just leftover phases. You had the major bat bathus granite form, but leftover magma produced that major dike. Leftover magma produced those minor dikes that kept on intruding one another. So this was a, a sequence. Um, I'll, I'll jump over that in the interest of time, that's not. But there's, there's the, the sequence there. Here's a photograph where you can see one of these harder later dikes. I've got the arrow there. You can see the line of uh, outcrop. It was a thin linear band where the molten rock had squeezed into a crack in the granite that was still cooling. Here's in the railroad cutting, you can see one of these dikes. You can see uh, fine flow banding at the edge of the dike, indicating it was cooling as it was flowing into this into this fracture in the, in the ground. The food granite phases were sequentially intruded while still hot into the fossil for a sedimentary strata during the five year. They were not primordial and they were thus not created cold in situ by feet, which is Bob Gentry's view. Thus, the plating halos present. And it can't be you know, God's finger, primordial or God's fingerprints of creation. Um, due to the short half lives of, of radium polonium isolate and the grossly accelerated uranium pattern during the flood, these granites had to be sequentially intruded and crystallized and cooled below 150 degrees within days, or else there would have been not enough uh, polonium left to form the radio halos within the subsequent hours to days. So rapid halos formation was due to the transport of the radon and polonium within the host biotite flakes from the embedded zircon grains by the hydrothermal fluids by the cooling grag uh, magma and the, de the decreasing number of polonium radios and successive intrusions from granite pluton to major dike to minor dikes would have been due to the decreasing amounts of hydrothermal fluids with time. The system is waning in activity, so you had a higher amount of hydrothermal fluids from the big body of granite, so it had higher radio halo, colliding radio halo numbers. You went to the major dike, which had was under cooler conditions, had less radio, less fluids, therefore less colliding radio halo. So the really small dikes had very little hydrothermal fluids left. Here's an interesting diagram, and I'm nearly done. I also, and this, this is actually in the rate volume number two, we go, I, I sampled rocks spanning uh, conventional uh, radioactive ages from three billion years to the present. And you can see that in the rocks that correspond to the flood, where you would have had more water available in the sediments produced during the flood uh, to, to go into the magmas and help with the uh, transport of polonium to make polonium radio halos, the numbers of polonium radio, radio halos per granite body just goes through the roof compared to the pre flood rocks. Well, finally, and this is working still in progress, the Cornwall granite contains a huge number of, huge number of, in fact, the one there that's off the chart is actually from the, one of the granites in Cornwall. And the Cornwall granites have associated with them deposits of tin, uranium, copper, lead, zinc that was mined from the time of the Romans up to present present days. And these veins were generated by hydrothermal fluids generating the granites. So the large numbers of radio halos reflect large volumes of mineralizing hydrothermal fluids. It's work that I'm currently doing, I'm writing up for the next ICC, the National Conference on Creationism next year in Pittsburgh, is a similar study with the mould granite in New South Wales, Australia. It has hydrothermal veins containing tin and tungsten associated with it. And I want to show you that, in fact, the large volume of, 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 uh, of uh, hydrothermal fluids in the granites that produce the, tin, the, the, the metal veins was also responsible for large numbers of cologne radio halos in these granites. So that means we could actually go and study a granite to see how large the number of cologne radio halos in it 
to predict whether it might have metal deposits associated with it. So it's potentially a practical application in mineral exploration for these plain radio halos. And, but the, the corollary to that is that the metal veins, like the granites, would also have, have to form within, within days or weeks during the flood. And so this is very fruitful and exciting research. So let's conclude. Radar host provide evidence of the hundreds of millions of years worth at the day's rates of accelerated nuclear decay. They provide evidence of a new model for rapid cooling of granites in six to ten days, a new model for the rapid formation of cooling metamorphic rocks in only days to weeks. I didn't get time to expand on that, but that's a that's an implication as well. There's a whole study on that that I've been doing. Whoops. A potential model for the rapid formation of hydrothermal oil fluids and only uh, deposits in only days or weeks, and the time scales for these processes would thus be consistent with the biblical year-long flood event only four thousand three hundred years ago. And of course, this this accelerated nuclear decay therefore shows us that the the radioactive methods for dating rocks are thus unreliable and do not conflict with the time frame of Earth's history that the Bible presents at about 6,000 or so years. Thank you very much.